Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Amelia Holmes, and I am excited to introduce you to our speaker. David Robinson is the director and chief archaeologist of the Massachusetts Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources. Before joining the Massachusetts state government in 2019, he was president of the submerged cultural resource management consulting firm, David S. Robinson and Associates Incorporated, and a marine archaeologist at the URI Graduate School of Oceanography. Over the course of his 30 year career, David has specialized in multidisciplinary marine archaeological investigations of submerged shipwrecks, coastal infrastructure, and ancient cultural sites submerged by sea level rise conducted in the United States and in Scandinavia. David is a registered professional archaeologist and member of the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuaries Maritime Heritage Working Group. He served as the sanctuary's first maritime heritage representative on its Sanctuary Advisory Council and is a former member of NOAA's National Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee. In 2019, David was the recipient of the Tomaquit Tomaquag Museum's Eva Butler Scholar Award, recognizing his nearly two decades of collaborative marine archaeological work with Southern New England's indigenous communities. He holds an MA in nautical archaeology from Texas A&M University and a BA in anthropology and art from the University of Rhode Island. I am really excited to turn it over to David now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amelia. It's a real pleasure to be with you all tonight to uh, talk a little bit about uh, work that I've been involved with really since uh, for the last 20 years, and that's the archaeology of submerged paleocultural landscapes. I'm going to share my screen with you now to get our presentation started. All right. Um, as Amelia said, I am the director of the Massachusetts Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources, and for those of you who may not know, we uh, were formed in 1973, and we are the sole trustee of the Commonwealth's underwater cultural heritage. We are charged with encouraging the discovery, reporting, preservation, and protection of Massachusetts's underwater archaeological resources. The board is comp composed of the director, myself, and a nine-member nine -member, uh, multi-agency state board uh, that includes two governor-appointed recreational diving community representatives and a marine archaeologist. The UAR's jurisdiction, which you can see uh, on this map that's uh, here on the slide, extends over the inland and coastal waters of the state, and it includes shared jurisdiction with the Massachusetts Historical Commission in the intertidal zone. My, uh, my 30 year career as a professional underwater archaeologist has uh, taken me all up and down the eastern seaboard from, from uh, Maine and at the Canadian border down into uh, uh, the Chesapeake and also into the Gulf of Mexico and to Scandinavia, to Sweden and Denmark. I've had an opportunity to work on some really incredible projects, uh, both shipwreck projects and uh, submerged paleocultural landscapes projects. Uh, but the, the work that I'm going to talk about tonight is unique and extraordinary in that span of time that I've been doing under, underwater archaeology because it involves the work that I've been doing in the last in the better part of 20 years has been um, integrally involved with Southern New England's tribes, uh, with the tribal communities here. Um, and doing archaeology is interesting in its own right, but being able to do archaeology with uh, the indigenous communities that, that live here and um, learn about what makes their ancestral sites important, what makes them um, uh, or the things that you need to be thinking about uh, when you engage with these sites. Uh, it's been an extraordinary experience and a real honor to get to work with tribes in approaching this new, it's, it's a relatively new area of research, uh, submerged paleocultural landscapes archaeology in the United States really has, um, it, 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 it's kind of still in its infancy, it's, it's in entering about its second decade of, of active research. And so um, it's been really important to 
to involve and, and uh, look to the tribes for guidance and advice and input and participation in how we approach trying to identify their ancestral sites on the, the continental shelf offshore. And this research that we're doing that I've done um, over the last couple of decades here in, in New England, it's not entirely unique. There is other research being done throughout the United States, um, but it's, it's important research and it's changing what we know about uh, the, the ancient people of this land of, of North America. Um, for example, in 2016, there were two underwater ancient indigenous sites that were found off the coast of Florida. One that has pushed back the date of um, at least the archaeological record of people being in, in North America back to 14 and a half thousand years ago at a site called uh, the Page Ladson site in the Asilla River in Tallahassee. Another site uh, found off of Minnesota Key in the Gulf of Mexico near Venice. Uh, this site dates to about 7,000 years old and contains burials. So these discoveries in Florida are relevant to the work that we've done here in the Northeast and, and work throughout North America because they, they provide us with um, insights as to what the potential is to find not only really um, important types of sites that need protection like burials, but also to push the dates back that the archeological record has for uh, ancient native sites here. So a lot of the, the terminology that I've gotten used to using is probably not very familiar with most of you. Um, the, the common term that, that, you know, that's in the title of the talk tonight, submerged paleo landscapes, um, I, I should tell you what those are and why they're there. Um, paleo, submerged paleo landscapes really are, you know, obviously they're submerged and they're, they're, paleo is just a word meaning old, Latin word. These are ancient landscapes that have been submerged. Okay, well, why are they submerged? And, and which landscapes are we talking about? Well, the landscapes that we're talking about, or the, the, the kind of the slate where these landscapes could be preserved, is the, the outer continental shelf, all the way up to present shorelines. And this shelf was completely exposed at about 26,000 years ago, at the height of the last glaciation, when southern New England was covered in ice sheets, although not all of Nantucket was covered by ice. Uh, the majority of, of New England was, and uh, as a result of all this moisture being trapped in these ice sheets that were global, uh, there, were, there, were, there were ice sheets throughout the, the northern and southern hemispheres, all the water, all the, 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 the runoff, all the rain water that, that was frozen in these ice sheets uh, and wasn't able to get to the ocean caused lower than they are today on the order of about almost 400 feet lower. So the result was that the entire shelf was open land and uh, accessible and available to any of the ancient people that were here at the time. Go back to this one. But what's happened since the last glaciation is all this ice has melted, all the water has gone back into the sea. And as some of you are undoubtedly uh, aware, with uh, climate change and increased global warming today, uh, the, the rate of sea level rise has increased pretty dramatically in the last 50 to 100 years. And so um, what's happened is, is that shelf went underwater. The question is, is how much of the pre-submergence pre landscape was preserved? What of the old landscape that could have been inhabited by people wasn't destroyed by wave action, current, that would have eroded an impact that their whole landform. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We do have evidence, and we've, we've, we've had evidence for a long time, uh, going back 50 years or more, the, the first publications about evidence of these old landscapes began to appear in publications. Things like uh, deposits of peat and tree branches and terrestrial types of, of um, landform evidence began showing up in commercial fishermen's uh, nets when they were trying up in Georgia's banks, 
as well as uh, Nantucket Shoals. And the evidence that was found of these old landforms didn't just, um, wasn't just limited to plant material, but also to faunal material. Things like uh, mastodon and mammoth tusks and teeth were found and, and dragged up in, in nets and offshore uh, scallop dredges. Some of you may be, uh, may remember that uh, there was an offshore wind farm that was proposed for Nantucket Sound back in the early 2000s and that an archaeologist who was working on that project uh, happened to find evidence of submerged paleo landscapes. These were um, relict um, ancient forest floors and freshwater wetlands that were found. And the way that we identified those, and I was the project archaeologist that, that located these, was through doing a remote sensing surveying with site scan sonar, uh, marine magnetometer, multi-beam bathymetry, and also a special instrument that we use called sub-bottom profiler. And the sub-bottom profiler gives you images that are like a cross-section, as if you would cut through a, a layer cake. And you can see ancient deposits of riverbed channels and, and beach, um, beach fronts, as well as sometimes uh, partially preserved um, margins of channels, embayments, things like that that show up as a, a darker reflector in the ambient uh, visual field. So this is a sub bottom profiling record here on the right. And you can see this dark area there that's underneath the, the surface of the seafloor. And so we decided that we would, we would sample this area to determine what was causing that reflector. We, we did it through uh, coring that we'll talk about in a minute. But the area that we, we uh, found this submerged panel landscape was a long ways offshore much further than anything that had ever been found within the context of an archaeological survey before, out on a place called Horseshoe Shoals out in the middle of the Sound in federal, federal waters. When we took the cores, and we, we didn't take the cores just this one location, there were several locations where we saw these uh, sub-bottom profiling reflectors that appeared to be pretty interesting, but we, in this particular location, we, we took uh, of cores and there was a core that had been taken uh, earlier before I got involved in the project and we split these open to sample them and to examine them. And what we found was really quite extraordinary. We found a, an intact uh, stratigraphic profile. So that's the, the layering of the sediments through time. We found the, uh, when we opened one of the cores that there were intact uh, subsoils that we call them and then this organic layer of what would be the equivalent of kind of a marsh muck or, or a freshwater swamp, and then also uh, part of a, a deciduous upland forest floor that uh, had evidence when we, we sieved the, the samples that we took from, from this floor, found evidence of um, bug parts, green blades of grass, wood, leaves, and charcoal remnants, uh, seeds that were associated with freshwater swamps, and even delicate uh, root hairs that hadn't been destroyed as a result of the inundation process. And so this was a really important finding in that it told us that, hey, these ancient landforms can be preserved in high energy environments far offshore, and we need to be thinking about them when offshore projects are being built or developed, um, and be looking closely at them as closely as we can to determine whether or not there's any ancient cultural sites in these submerged paleo landscapes that should be avoided or, or preserved. The radiocarbon dates that we got from some of these samples were also pretty extraordinary. The deeper samples that were down about 11 feet below the surface of the seafloor dated to about 10,000 years ago. And then ones that were about half that distance below the seafloor uh, dated a, a birch wood fragment. Um, we got a radiocarbon date of about 5,500 years ago. And so what we were able to do is, is kind of reconstruct the paleo landscape that existed at the time. And, and we realized that on the edge of, um, on the edge of Horseshoe Shoal there, what we had encountered was a preserved flank of that shoal when it had been kind of a, a bit of a peninsula when sea level was lower and adjacent to a, a big freshwater and then what would have become a saltwater basin on the flank of the shoal there. So this was, this was fairly extraordinary. 
And as a result of these findings, in part, there are other reasons, but um, the keeper of the National Register of Historic Places in 2010 determined that, that Nantucket Sound was eligible for listing in the National Register as a traditional cultural property and as an historic and archaeological property. And the keeper based his um, determination of this on the fact that the site, this area, had important cultural, historical, um, and scientific information still to yield, and it could be yielded through doing archaeology. So it was a very, um, it was an important kind of a uh, milestone in underwater paleocultural landscapes archaeology for this uh, for the study to be done for the findings that we had and the determination that Nantucket Sound was a uh, significant place uh, for, for indigenous people here. In addition to the finds, the serendipitous finds by fishermen and the, the work that we did out on Horseshoe Shoal, uh, there's also a, a, a rich oral history that the indigenous people of this, this land have here. And at least for the Narragansett tribe, uh, we had learned, and I, I live in Rhode Island and have done a lot of work on this topic in Rhode Island. But um, in, in talking to the Narragansett, Indian Tribal Historic Preservation Office, we learned that their um, late medicine, tribal medicine woman, she had related to them a story about how more than 15,000 years ago, these ancient villages, there were ancient villages of the ancestral Narragansett that were out where the ocean is now. And then overnight, these ocean waters began to rise and people had to evacuate their ancient homes. So not only do we have the, the Western scientific evidence that there's, there's something that's that's out there, there's something that's preserved on, on the continental shelf or on the coast of Southern New England, but we also have the indigenous community here uh, and their ancient oral histories saying pretty much the same thing. And as a result of the concerns of the, the tribes here in, in Southern New England and in the face of a lot of orf, offshore development, energy development, uh, renewal, renewable energy development, uh, the, the, the tribes began asking the federal agencies and state agencies involved in the permitting of these projects about what standardized protocols exist for identifying ancient tribal cultural sites out on the shelf. And so as a result of, of these, these, these questions and, and there not being a great answer, um, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, a federal agency that permits offshore uh, wind energy, partnered with the state of Rhode Island and the Rhode Island Coastal Resource Management Council and the Narragansett Indian Tribal Historic Preservation Office on a project to answer those questions. And this project uh, took place between 2012 and 2019, and it involved us looking at a number of locations off the Rhode Island coast, both ones that were in protected interior waters of Narragansett Bay, but also in some offshore areas. Uh, right around Block Island and then out between uh, Martha's Vineyard and Block Island. And the, and the purpose of the project was, yes, to answer the questions that had been raised, but also to develop uh, scientifically based, tribally sensitive, best practice methodology for identifying ancient land forms and the sites that they contained offshore, with the, the goal to be uh, provide decision makers at federal and state agencies and tribal agencies um, with the information that they you know, can use to ensure that any ancient native cultural sites that are submerged offshore within project areas that are being developed could be avoided or protected from impacts. And so, uh, as I said, um, you know, this, this project uh, involved working directly with indigenous community and involved the indigenous community and in particular the, the Narragansett Indian tribe uh, in um, all aspects of the project from the researches and development to the actual field work and then the analysis of the data that was collected as part of the field work. And so it was, uh, it was very much an, an integrated project in terms of bringing not only multiple disciplines such as marine biology and, and archaeology but also uh, multiple cultures, uh, indigenous cultures as well as non-indigenous cultures. And we, we 
we worked hard towards looking at the existing technologies that we had available to us, such as the side scan sonar that I mentioned, and subbar profiler, and swab imagery, and, and marine magnetometry, and GPS positioning. We, we, we looked at these technologies that are typically used for mapping the seafloor to try to maximize their utility in identifying ancient paleo landforms and the sites they might contain. And so we, we collected sub-bottom profiling data that was, was pretty compelling, you know, that identified, allowed us to identify elements of ancient landforms in some of the study areas, like uh, the one we looked at in Greenwich Bay, near Desert Bay. And we were able to identify things like paleo channels that you see here in the sub-bottom record, as well as the, the surface that is the, the repayment surface, the erosional surface that sea level is rising. Um, it's the surface that gets disturbed by, by sea level rise. And so um, in areas that we found these um, paleo landscape or evidence of paleo landscapes in the remote sensing data and the sub bottom profiling data, we went and record and ground truth the, the data and use that information to begin to reconstruct what the old landforms might have looked like that are now submerged and buried underneath, in this case, the bay floor in, in Greenwich Bay. And as a result of the the work that we did on the project in each of the areas, um, we were able to identify a paleoenvironmental record in one of the glacial ponds near Greenwich Bay that provided us with an environmental uh, record, kind of a backdrop to whatever cultural material we would find, an environmental backdrop that went back to 12, 000, 12 and a half thousand years ago. In Greenwich Bay, we documented multiple paleo drainage systems and associated floodplains that were transitioning from freshwater to then marsh and into saltwater uh, bay embayment and identified several uh, different deposits of paleocultural material in buried intact, stratigraphically intact uh, deposits dating from about 1200 to 1500 years ago and found in the swarf zone uh, in the interface between shore and land uh, cultural material that spanned 9,000 years of human history. So this was a significant uh, site at, uh, at Greenwich Bay. In Block Island, and this is what I'm going to talk to you about in some, some detail, we documented in a higher energy zone the preservation of a 6,500 to 800 year old submerged paleocultural landscape that had an intact forest floor, a possible heart feature, and artifact concentrations at two locations. And then at the mud hole location, one of the far offshore sites and the area of neutral interest between Rhode Island and Massachusetts, we found that at the mud hole, there was evidence of a sandy beach deposit in a formal terrestrial shoreline that was part of this, this deeper feature. And then also um, we were able to tell from looking at data at the EMI that just because when you look at the seafloor that's, that's submerged today, if it looks flat and featureless, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's nothing there in terms of uh, geological formations of interest. In fact, we found that it's the, the surface of the seafloor is a poor proxy for what my, might lie below, buried beneath the seafloor. So that was another important finding is in that study. Uh, as I said, we wanted to know more about, uh, we looked at, at uh, protected inland waterways in Narragansett Bay, but we wanted to, to take a look at uh, places that were a little bit more exposed to see what types of landforms might be preserved in these higher energy environments. We'd seen in, in Market Sound that there was the potential for landforms to be preserved, but we wanted to take a look somewhere closer to, to our, uh, well, somewhere within our study area and, and see what, see if we could get a better handle on um, what types of landforms are preserved from, and whether or not there's any cultural material in these landforms. So we looked at a place on the west side of Block Island where in the intertidal, there were paleo landforms that were exposed that had tree stumps in them. These tree stumps dated in age from about 700 to 1200 years ago. So we went out, we did non-disturbance survey that consisted of doing uh, diver uh, surveys. We did some coring in one of the nearby uh, salt ponds. And what we discovered was this incredibly intact landform that extended from the intertidal out into water that was about 12 to 15 feet deep and about 100 uh, meters offshore. And in this landform, we found a completely preserved impact forest floor with root mat, tree stumps dated from about 33, 3200 years ago. And this is a picture that I took when I took it 
I made the hair stand up on my arms because I was looking at the past and the, the, the present all at once, spanning a 3,000 year period where you have this ancient landscape that once was terrestrial, but undoubtedly was occupied by my colleague, uh, Charlie Machado's ancient ancestors. And now here she is, this, this native person from the future, hovering over this ancient landscape in this alien garb, this dive gear that allows her to go underwater. It's just a, an extraordinary moment. These are uh, some close-ups of some of the, the paleosols or the old land surfaces that we found that are kind of, uh, uh, you know, think of, think of walking through the woods and in the, in after the fall, it's early spring, and the duff and the, the leaves and the sticks and the branches that are all left on top of the forest floor. That's essentially what we had here, along with um, kind of a, a freshwater swampy environment. And so we found, again, insect seed and leaf fragments that were all a part of this ancient landscape that dated to uh, about 6,500 years ago. These are some of the tree, tree stumps that we saw at the site. And then one of the most extraordinary finds was what appears to be a hearth feature that was intact and buried embedded into this, this, uh, this paleo land, land surface. And we found charred wood, uh, burnt ground surface with baked clay glass. So it was clearly something that had been impacted by fire and appeared to be a preserved hearth and there were cobbles around the hearth. And we also found uh, within about a meter of the hearth Again, embedded in, it was in situ in the preserved paleos halls, uh, large pieces of quartz chipping debris that ancient native people living in this area were using to make stone tools. So in addition to the, the cultural sites, uh, the work that we did on the west side of Block Island showed us that uh, preserved stratigraphy exists not just in Nantucket Sound, not just in the protected abatements within Narragansett Bay, but also within a higher energy environment like we have on the west side of Block Island. And uh, although the picture I showed you that looked very tranquil, um, the surface picture of the exposed heat deposit, I assure you it gets very rough in the winter there. The uh, picture was taken in, in early spring. But um, again, we, what we were finding is that intact stratified elements of the old pre-inundation uh, landscape can be preserved in these, these offshore environments. And so it becomes really important to consider them when uh, projects are being developed offshore and to not rule out of hand as had been the practice for decades in archaeology, but even, even the possibility that there would be anything preserved offshore in the way of a, a paleo landscape or an archaeological deposit. And what we, we also learned was, um, and we, we saw this a bit in, in Nantucket Sound too, but what we saw very clearly on Block Island was that what gets preserved of that pre-inundation landscape after it's been inundated aren't the topographic highs. So aren't the areas like you see here on the erosional beachfront right off from where uh, these deposits that we found in the water were. But what we get preserved are the margins of where topographic, former topographic lows and wetlands meet these, these uplands. As an archaeologist, uh, you might think, well, that's unfortunate because we know that most of the time settlements are on high and dry terrestrial environments because nobody wants to sleep in a swamp. Um, but in fact, that we have that margin between wet and, and dry and high and low preserved underwater is really significant because that is the interface where most of the activity that is taking place, uh, whether it's hunting, fishing, uh, procuring water, traveling, um, trading, a lot of that's taking place right there at that, that interface between, between wet and you know, the, the water and the land. So it's, um, it's good that this is what we have uh, preserved for us because I, I think it's going to be an archaeologically rich environment to have available to us. And so as a result of the project, in addition to the scientific findings, uh, we developed some best practice recommendations for how agency tribes and researchers ought to engage. And basically it came down to that we needed to develop and improve communications 
relationships and capacity to, to work together. And then we also um, produced um, or, or came to some conclusions about the, the geologies, the geoforms that should be explored when doing offshore survey. And that predictive models for trying to determine where archaeological sites could be located underwater. Um, we don't have enough geological information that's been looked at from a, through an archaeological lens or a, a indigenous culture lens to begin to decide which, which areas are really going to be sensitive for containing sites and those that might not be. So, um, you know, the, the project ultimately uh, determined that, you know, we need to work on building a geological archaeological database, we need to build capacity, and we need to build community. And in terms of the, the, the paleo geoforms that we think should be sought after during surveys offshore, we identified a deposit that's called uh, QFE, and uh, that means quaternary fluvial estuarine deposits. So these are deposits that post-date the exposure of the shell predate its inundation. So these are what would have been formally exposed portions of the landscape. And we see these, they've been mapped in places. In fact, in Nantucket Sound, the USGS has mapped QFB in a number of places that are highlighted on this little map here in green. And um, what's important about identifying these is, is that you know, right now we have multiple offshore wind farm projects that are being proposed south of the Massachusetts coastline, the transmission cables for which are going, you know, some of those are going to end up getting rooted through Nantucket Sound. So the, the surveys that are being done uh, for these projects hopefully are going to determine whether or not these QFE deposits really are what we think they are in terms of the ability to tell us something about preservation of ancient landforms and the ancient cultural material they might contain. But also, um, you know, it's an opportunity for all of us to learn. The data that's collected from these projects is going to be extremely informative. And uh, BUAR, Massachusetts Historical Commission, and the tribes are all working together with, with the offshore developers and their surveyors to uh, come up with the, the best methods for identifying ancient native sites that are, uh, could be preserved in these areas. So with that, um, I think I'm at the end of my, my time limit. I'd uh, be happy to take any questions and talk to you about uh, any of the aspects of the nice talk. Or any other questions you have about marine archaeology that I can try to answer. Oh, hi, David. That was uh, incredible. Um, I just, it's, it's always amazing to me how there's just so much uh, one like that I don't know about and that, you know, you have such a depth of knowledge and it's just amazing. And we've had one question come in that says, how do the prevailing currents and movement of shoals impact your surveying or site discovery? And then um, the, the shoals around Nantucket, they're constantly moving, right? And how would you choose your sites to reconstruct paleo landscapes? That's a great question. Um, so one of the things that surprised me when I was doing archaeology in Nantucket Sound was that because it is a, it's, it's, it's fairly shallow water overall, um, so it's, it's very much impacted by wind energy and waves and currents it's as a high energy marine environment that I, I initially, I didn't think would have much potential for preserving any ancient paleo landscapes. So um, what I was surprised to find there was that what we saw were the, the, the landforms that were preserved, again, they tend to be on the edges and on the, the bottoms of these former topographic lows. And in the case of the area that we saw in Nantucket Sound, they were buried under uh, marine sediments and under um, very uh, loose coarse sand that we know from the surveys that we did over the course of the project that the sand is moving around a lot. And so the impression that I had was that it was acting almost like a shock absorber and taking a lot of the energy of the water, motion, the, you know, water movement from currents and, and wind driven waves and, and so forth 
taking a lot of that energy, absorbing it, moving above these, these buried landforms that didn't move, that, that were actually preserved and, and stayed intact. And um, we saw some of that on Block Island as well. And the, and the way that we, we map them is we don't pay any attention to the so much to the, 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 the surface sediments as we do what's buried and appears in the, the sub bottom record. That's really where we're going to find areas that um, we want to map. And the, the areas that are seem to have the highest archaeological sensitivity that are preserved, again, are those margins of uh, depressions, former topographic lows or, or swamp areas, um, embayment, shorelines, river channel margins, that kind of, that kind of environment. Uh, because that, again, is that, that's an interface between land and water that people would have been using in ancient times, just like we are today. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, can you tell us, have any studies been done in Cape Cod Bay? The USGS has collected data, but in terms of archaeological assessments of that data for this particular purpose, I don't, I'm not aware of any. Um, we had the same question also for, for Long Island Sound off of um, Connecticut. Yeah. So Long Island Sound, I did a, um, a number of surveys there earlier in my career. And what's interesting about Long Island Sound is that you definitely had an environment that had been, uh, had terrestrial exposure within the sound in places. Um, but um, with the, 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 you know, the, the Glacial Lake Connecticut dumped through the sound, scoured out and moved a, a lot of a, a lot of landform, a lot of sediments, and then post inundation with tidal regimes and, and the strong tides that come in and out of the sound through the race, you, you had a, a situation where the the, the the sedimentation within a goodly part of the sound really buried very deeply a lot of the land surfaces that we might be interested in. So what you'd have to do is if you were surveying within the sound, you need to find kind of a sweet spot for where erosion and sedimentation were sort of equal and the, the sediment, you know, the post inundation sediments were thin enough to where you could actually access those, those old land surfaces to do some archaeological work. Cool. So there's a question about, have, you know, you've talked about Nantucket Sound, obviously, but what if any discoveries have been made closer to the island? Has there been any work done in the harbor itself or is that too shallow? Well, I would, I would venture to guess that um, based on what we've seen in the, in the work that I've done, uh, the closer you get to shore, the less time water action has had to work on the places that were once terrestrial that are now submerged and are now in some cases exposed. Like the area that we found on the west side of Block Island was exposed, we think, because of the erosion that was caused by Hurricane Sandy when it stripped away a lot of a lot of the former beach front and exposed these things and, and you know they ended up being uh, submerged. So you know my 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 educated guess is that in areas closer to shore, you're more likely to find preserved you know, land farms that, that could contain sites. Of course, the, the pre, you know, the pre inundation topography and then the post inundation um, dynamics that impact these, these exposed or, or submerged and buried landforms is critically important. What you find is it's not like filling a bathtub everything that was on the continental shelf once that once was exposed is preserved is just now all underwater that's does not at all appear to be the case it seems to be that you get preferential preservation in these areas that were protected you know like that but area that we found uh, off the horseshoe shoal was on the inside of this sort of fish hook shaped landform that would have protected it protected that margin after inundation for any really super high energy wave action so topography, pre-submergence topography and post-submergence conditions play a major role on how things are or are not preserved. And, and what we see by and large is that a lot of area was destroyed by erosion caused by sea level rise. 
Um, so kind of building off of that in these preserved sites, is there significant similar work happening elsewhere off our coasts or in other countries? Yeah, so the work that I did in Denmark um, was driven by uh, learning that Danish underwater archaeologists had been engaged in submerged Stone Age archaeology. So essentially the same thing we were trying to do here they had been doing there and they've been doing it for about 30 years longer than we have. So they had advanced methodologies much beyond what, what we were even beginning to think was possible. And so um, they played a significant role in informing archaeologists in the U.S. about potentially what could, what could be done because they were finding incredible sites that were submerged in offshore context there. And the, the preservation of these, the, the sites that they're finding particularly of organic material, which on terrestrial context typically doesn't get preserved very well here in, in New England. Uh, you had incredible preservation there. Uh, one of the sites that I worked on dated to 9,000, seven to 9,000 years ago. And we were finding wooden artifacts, uh, faunal material that the, the, the wooden artifacts, they were the bases of the stakes that were used, so sort the of witties that were used to build these dome shaped structures that they lived in that had been pushed down into the, the clay 7,000 years ago, they still had bark on them. They looked, when we first found them underwater, they looked like they had been cut, you know, yesterday and they were 7,000 years old. So we learned a lot from our Danish colleagues about what was possible here. And, and they've been involved, they were involved in a lot of work that, that we did on this merged paleocultural landscapes project at, at URI as advisors. That's pretty amazing, um, especially what you're saying about the, the tree with bark still on it. Um, that's just incredible to think about. Um, bringing it back closer to us here, are there any submerged prehistoric sites in Nantucket Sound that are being further evaluated for the National Register at this time? Not that I'm aware of. Hmm. Okay, cool. So um, just looking through, we've had several questions come in. Um, I don't know, uh, I certainly don't know if you'll know the answer to this, but have the peat banks at Pulpus Harbor or Eel Point on Nantucket been carbon-14 dated? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and have you looked into the area near Horseshoe Shoal, uh, measured a few years ago, being about 100 feet deep? It was located about a quarter mile west of um, one of the sites you examined, this questioner has said. And, and 100 feet of water? Yeah, it says measured a few years ago at about 100 feet deep. Um, and it was uh, thought to be an ancient native site? Or, a, or Well, perhaps if the uh, asker would like to send additional information, we can follow up. Um, <laughs> so this, is, uh, this question has come in anonymously. For those of us entirely opposed to any wind devices in the sound or anywhere, are you having any effect on prohibiting them? I don't think, well, the, the, the review process, the federal review process um, that wind farms go through, uh, it's known as the Section 106 National Historic Preservation Act review process, which BOEM is now in, actually in the process of integrating and, and substituting its National Environmental Policy Act uh, review process uh, for that process requires federal agencies to consider the impacts of the projects they either do for themselves, that they permit, uh, that others are doing, or that they fund. The, they're required to uh, consider the impacts to cultural heritage, whether it be submerged or own. And whenever possible to avoid um, or uh, reduce or mitigate adverse effects from those projects to cultural resources. So it's never been, it's, never, it's, it's, it's unusual for the identification of significant sites to stop a project or prevent a project. What more frequently happens is projects get redesigned to avoid them. Uh, and so it's, that's, that's been my experience in the 30 years that I've been doing consulting archaeology is that typically doesn't prevent the projects, but it definitely can result in the redesign of the projects to protect the resource. Mm 
Um, yeah, that, that kind of, uh, as a non-archaeology person, that lines up with uh, what, I've, what I'm aware of. Um, and we have two more related questions to, uh, to the wind. Um, what kind of archaeological survey is typically required for offshore projects that warrant Section 106 or similar review? Is it usually assessment level or are the project areas surveyed with sonar, magnetometry, etc.? And is the potential for submerged pre-contact sites seriously considered? Yes, definitely. And again, because um, because of the work that we've done here in southern New England and some of the work that's been done in other parts of the, the country, uh, but, but by and large, the work that we've done here to make a broad community of people at agencies and in academia and in tribal communities aware of the potential for these sites to be preserved and also providing um, advice and, and assistance and trying different technological approaches for identifying them, as well as working with tribal partners to um, share and collaborate on information sharing. Uh, you know, basically everybody putting their shoulder in the wheel to try to figure out, okay, where are these sites going to be located so that we can avoid them and protect them during project design. Um, that's that's something that uh, very much developed here and, and people are aware of it. So, you know, in our guidelines that you can see if you go on to the, if you just Google Mass VAR, you can uh, look at our statutes and regulations. You can see that in our regulations, um, we certainly require that surveys be done as identification surveys to try to determine whether or not sites are present or absent. And the federal agencies you know, and that's, that's the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management that permits the offshore projects. They have their own guidelines that are also you can look at online for identifying these sites and the types of instrumentation that needs to be used. So they're not just desktop studies, they're not just background research that's done, there's field surveys that have to be done to determine uh, present likelihood of presence or absence of these ancient sites in, in these offshore project areas. So that involves I scan sonar, sub bottom profiler, uh, marine magnetometer, um, and usually multi beam uh, bathymetry survey being done, remote sensing survey, all non destructive, non disturbance, um, along with uh, coring that's done. And frequently, what happens on these big projects is the engineering data needs are combined with the archaeological data needs. And so, you know, the, the data that's collected is very expensive to collect this data time consuming, um, but it can be used for multiple purposes. And as a, as a consulting archaeologist, I always was trying to get my, my hands on all the data that I could to identify resources. Um, thank you. I mean, that's, I, I feel like I speak for a, a lot of the audience when I say that I just uh, have learned so much from you tonight, um, just about marine archaeology in general and how it, it's impacting our lives. I mean, how your work has such an impact on, on our lives today. Um, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us tonight. Um, I really appreciated um, your time. And I want to thank Pleasure. our members. Yeah, and I want to thank you guys here also for spending part of your evening with us tonight. Um, media sponsorship for this evening's event is generously provided by Novation Media. Please join us on February 2nd with Nidra Lee. Um, she's going to talk about the archaeological investigations that have been conducted at the Boston Higginbotham House, part of the Museum of African American History on the island. Um, and programs such as this one are made possible thanks to the support of our members. So if you are not a member, please do consider joining by heading to nha.org membership. And thank you all again so much and have a great night.